When I was a young man, my friends had a nickname for me. They called me Eric. Because <laughs> I was always pulling a helicopter off the cat track or climbing up in a tree to jump out into the water. My whole sense of self was physical. I climbed Mount Rainier, I skied Mount Rainier. Um, by the time I was 11, I was the Washington State Champion gymnast. When I graduated from high school in 1983, 18 years old, six of us decided to water ski around Bainbridge Island. 32 miles, six behind the same boat, and we decided, oh, we should raise money for a charity. And I remember in that 18-year-old physical sense of self thinking, the Arthritis Foundation? That's kind of lame. <laughs> it, isn't that for old people? But be careful what you think. Because when I turned 21, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And by age 30, I really couldn't walk. I went from state champion gymnast to becoming old, and my life consisted mostly of sitting. Now, in 1996, I had both of my knees totally replaced, and that gave me some measure of mobility back. And a couple of years later, I started taking a breakthrough biotechnology drug that really gave me a second chance at life. Now, during that time when I, was, when I was disabled, I couldn't work consistently, but I had access to my neighbor's shop, and I started making furniture out of wood that I had found and, and sold it at the local farmer's market. And one of my customers who commissioned some, some pieces from me, from a tree that came down in his yard, was really, really excited when he found out that my grandfather was Charles Lindbergh. And, and he said, oh my God, you have to build me a, a sculpture of the spirit of St. Louis. And I said, oh, I don't think so. I do this crazy wildwood furniture and, and I'm allergic to straight wood and measuring tapes. Uh, <laughs> and besides, you can order one of those things out of the back of an aviation magazine and it'll be perfect. I don't do perfect. And he said, no, you don't get it. My brother and I, when we were kids, we read your grandfather's book, The Spirit of St. Louis, and it, and it lit us up. We both now fly 747s across the Atlantic. It changed our lives. And he said, and that would be the most meaningful gift that I could give to my brother. And I, and I had, you know, who could resist that? I thought, well, let me, I don't know if I can do this, but let me go play around in my shop and, and see what happens. And as I started building this unique shape of, of the spirit of St. Louis and, and sanding on the, the wings, the, the waves of grain, I started thinking about the waves on the ocean. And then as it came together, flying it in my hands through my shop and putting myself in my mind's eye into the cockpit of the spirit of St. Louis and wondering, what was it like? What was that flight like for my grandfather to fly 33 hours with only a compass through the night? Um, that flight really changed his life more than any other single event. In fact, it changed the world. And I started to think, huh, could I do that? I became a pilot at age 24 and um, realized I wanted to do what my flight instructor was doing, and so I got my flight instructor rating and a commercial pilot certificate. But I had to give all that up because of my physical body. But I also realized, you know, I don't know if I'll get a third chance at life. So, maybe I should do that. So, in 2002, I actually did. I retraced my grandfather's flights from, from San Diego to St. Louis, St. Louis to New York, and then New York to Paris in a small, single-engine aircraft, and took off from New York on a 17-hour <clears throat> flight. I used a, a modern airplane, because it seemed kind of risky to do it in, in an old one. Uh, <laughs> I actually survived the, the flight, which was my prime directive. And I did this really not only to celebrate the 75th anniversary of grandfather's flight or to look back and, and understand more about myself, but to really look at and promote the future of flight. And at that time, I was working in space flight. So 17-hour flight, I'm, it's my first trip to Europe. It's my first trip to France, and so I'm really excited, but th that's not a French kiss. So, I, I love this photo, and I like to say, thank this man for shifting the world's perspective on aviation. And I don't mean my grandfather, I mean the guy on the right. His name was Raymond Ortig. In 1919, Raymond Ortig put up a $25,000 prize. 
And a funny thing happened as a result of that. Seven teams spent $400,000 trying to win that $25,000 prize. <laughs> and all of that research and development went into long-distance air travel. That's extraordinary leverage, if you think about it. People forget that, that aviation was developed primarily by two things, warfare and prizes. <laughs> and I love that sculpture, the Bendix Prize. But, but it makes you wonder, well, what else can we do with prize philanthropy? Can we change the future? In, in 1996, under the arch in St. Louis, we launched the X Prize Foundation, a $10 million prize for the first privately funded manned space program. And in 2004, Spaceship One took off out of the Mojave Desert flew up to, into space, 328,000 feet, returned safely, and did it again within two weeks to prove it was, uh, it was reusable. And we shifted the world's perspective on spaceflight and jump-started the, the private space industry. What that did to us as a team was that it, it, it empowered us in a, in a, in a very in, uh, amazing way. And it made us think, you know, if we can get this... Spaceship One in the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum next to the Spirit of St. Louis. Um, can we do that again? And can we do it better? So that led to the creation of LEAP. And right now we're working on the electric aircraft industry. So we're giving prizes to uh, help advance the development, stimulate the development of the electric aircraft industry. What we imagine is the future, is really a Jetson's future that we all grew up with. Simple, safe, renewable, energy-powered, personal electric air vehicles taking off from quiet pocket airports near our homes, really revolutionizing the way that we travel about the planet. But I have to leave myself open to the possibility that this grand vision might actually harm our quality of life. It's true. We cannot predict every problem that comes with or as a side effect of a grand vision. So it might not be all good. So what that led me to do is think, well, okay. <laughs> How do we create a whole generation of problem solvers and innovators? And that led to the LEAP education program. Basically, high school students form a team, build a work plan, go out and investigate a solution to a problem or an innovator. We don't care if it's in aviation or biology or robotics, just that they're focused on innovation. Then they create a, a short video documentary, video storytelling about innovation, and leverage that story as far and wide as possible. What we want to do here as we scale is, is have student teams all over the world uploading video documentaries focused on innovation and winning scholarships and prizes for their work motivating a generation to seek out problems and solutions to problems as potential opportunities for their lives. So what happens when you give a guy like me another chance at life? I can work again, I can make sculptures, I can travel, I can ski. I can change the world. What happens when you give a student a powerful voice? Cisco Systems predicts that by 2013, 90% of the traffic on the internet will be video-based. This is an incredibly important skill, video storytelling, that we need to give to our kids as they move into their college and their work careers. I imagine creating a future where this little guy will have the opportunity to experience the quality of life that I have, that we all have today. Maybe he'll even get a chance to fly into space and look back and experience what those astronauts describe as everything that they know and love and depend upon to survive is down here on this, this fragile blue ball. Really, truly the only sustainable, self-contained spaceship that we have, Spaceship Earth. Now, I made this funny T-shirt design in the outline of an embryo to symbolize our infancy in terms of human potential. We think we're pretty smart with our PowerPoint presentations and our smartphones, but really we've only taken the tiniest leap. Ladies and gentlemen, truly, 
we've only just begun. Thank you.